Thank you, Indy, and hello, everybody. And um, I guess the short answer to the question of why we're all meeting, is it impossible? Absolutely not. And I hope we can have a useful discussion on that in the short time that is available to us. Um, I also want to thank ICRC and others who, of course, worked hard to update the, the standards and to the organizers of today for inviting me to be here. I'm very pleased to participate in this discussion. Uh, in the short time available, what I'm going to try to do is focus on a few of the big picture issues. I'm going to um, provide a short context so that we're understanding the history that uh, is behind us and how we're going to be the kind of situations we're moving into as the world moves forward. And then I'm going to focus in on a few generic issues, focus on contemporary crisis, in particular, as Wendy said, Sri Lanka. And then if, times allow, if, times allow, if, time, if time allows, to flag a few issues about going forward, how we can build on our experience to date. So in terms of you know, trying to situate this discussion, we all know that um, in 2013, it's 150 years since 1863 in the launch of the International Committee of the Red Cross and uh, quickly thereafter, the first Geneva, first Geneva Convention. And of course, the last century was a time of great change and scientific advancement, but it was also one of the deadliest uh, centuries in human history. And it's unclear, moving into the 21st millennium, how much we have learned and gained from that. Clearly, we have lots of very important norms. Um, immediately, it seems that uh, difficult situation gives rise to more norm making. So, of course, 1948, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, 1949, the Four Geneva Conventions. And then, as we came in towards the end of the Cold War and uh, launched into the post Cold War world, a lot of effort in uh, improving the ability of the humanitarian system to bite into protection concerns. In the 1990s, as we saw that refugee flows uh, declined, uh, the situation of IDPs and others, particular ISPs, those who were eternally stuck, more came to the fore. However, we've also seen uh, in this past 10 to 12 years, especially in the wake of 9-11 and the initiation of the global war on terror, also quite a number of setbacks when it comes to securing respect for basic norms. Uh, so the basic uh, message I want to say on this, since we only have a few moments, is that we're in a time of great social, economic, and political change. And that is political change here in the global north, and of course, great change in the global south. And as we see power shifts at the international level, um, uh, evolve, this will clearly give rise to all of us who consider ourselves humanitarians and concerned about the protection issues that uh, are part and parcel of um, situations of crises, whether that is conflict or disasters associated with um, natural hazard events. So I guess the one thing I want to say about the past and its connection to the future I want to flag is the importance of local actors. And I think we are seeing that come more to the fore. Uh, I think it's one of the constants. I think w perhaps one of the changes between the past and the present is that whereas it seems there are more of us concerned about the protection of civilians, there are also um, lots of challenges to that. And that I think one of those challenges will be that as local actors are more to the fore, they will also question what I'm going to say is our version of um, universal humanitarian standards. So th I guess the basic takeaway is that we're facing into old as well as a whole lot of new challenges. Uh, Wendy said I'm going to focus on just a few of the generic issues, and I have, um, given the time constraints we're operating under, uh, scrunch these down to three, which is basically commitment. I think not a lot of it, quite lim limited in many situations. Um, confusion, I think unfortunately quite a lot, and we can discuss that in a moment. And then the issue of competence. There is a lot of com competence. We, ha we have learned a lot. However, there are also factors that quite undermines the effectiveness of, of what we know better, uh, both about the issues and how to address them. So on the issue of commitment, which I'm going to dwell on a little bit, because I do consider it one of our biggest problems. I think it also puts into question the value of our norm building and standard setting and the various reform initiatives that have been part and parcel of the humanitarian community over, over the, o in recent years. And of course, this is not to take away from the enormous investment, both of individual humanitarian agencies and also the system in training and making ourselves 
better able to deal with crisis situations. But I think um, I left Afghanistan in 2010 and remained working on it for a little while. And I remember when, Sri Lanka, when sorry, Syria, I have to be careful with my S's, when Syria started coming to the fore in 2011, talking to people uh, at agencies, but also in Geneva when I was there at the time, and basically a bit, being a bit taken aback when a lot of inter interlocutors basically re started referring to Sir Syria as a human rights crisis. In other words, it seemed to be, there seemed to be a reluctance to bite into both the evolving situation that I think was reasonably clear on the horizon. We knew uh, there was a big danger of the situation getting worse. And what seems to me limited investment and preparedness for that coming storm. And of course, I, I'm not going to comment further on Syria at this point, but we do know it, it is a very, very difficult situation. What I have can, however, talk about a little bit more is about Sri Lanka. And I'm going to talk about Sri Lanka because when I was working in Kabul, I was asked why in Afghanistan we were making such a fuss about civilian casualties, given that indeed many more people were dying in Sri Lanka. I'm talking about Sri Lanka towards the end phase of the war, from the end of, la well, the middle of 2008 to the middle of 2009. There have been a number of studies done on on Sri Lanka at the individual agency level, but not at the system level, which is perhaps something we need to discuss, why there was such limited energy, or I think commitment, to investigate the, the failure that most of us accept did occur in Sri Lanka. So I pulled out just six of the problems that I think point to our, when I say our, I'm talking about the humanitarian system, uh, inadequate levels of commitment to addressing the protection concerns that arise in these really terrible situations. And one of them is instrumentalization. I think it's reasonably well understood and accepted that the humanitarian endeavor was used by both sets of warring parties, and indeed by others, to the detriment of the safety and well-being of um, those who were eventually trapped in the vani as the war came to its end. Uh, the other uh, issue is when the relief system was given an exit notice in September 2008, the extent to which it did comply with that without a lot of challenge to it. Uh, I think one of the most um, troubling, one of the many troubling issues about Sri Lanka is the, the way in which the indiscriminate bombardment of the so-called no-fire zones, that in effect were free-fire zones, and uh, civilians, including our own colleagues who were trapped in there, the use of the trapped population by the Tamil Tigers as, as hostages, so that they couldn't flee even when they wanted to, wanted to do, try to do so. And then I think the last two points I have on this is that there was quite strong evidence of what was happening, that the way in which the civilians and including very rudimentary health facilities were being bombarded, and that it was largely government artillery fire that was largely responsible for that. The UN and others did know about it, but that unassailable evidence was not used and of course, the internal UN report that came to light towards the end of last year spells that out in great detail. And then um, when those of the war survivors uh, ended up in internment camps, I mean, my general view of it is that there were some challenges to it, but for the most part, it was pretty muted advocacy on that. When speaking, I was in Sri Lanka last summer, when speaking to some of the survivors and those who were involved at the time, I mean, some of the perspectives which we in this room and those listening in may or may not agree with, was that basically part of the problem was that agencies have gone corporate, that quite often and too often it is the bottom line that counts, and that basically a question then is, have we become too big for protection? And I say that, as I mentioned a few moments ago, the extent to which there has not been, I mean, there's been some effort to go back and examine what happened and didn't happen in Sri Lanka, but there has been no collective um, humanitarian system endeavor up till now to do that in, in, a, in a robust fashion. So that's my capsule on what I consider inadequate levels of commitment to dealing with the protection issues that arise in crisis settings. Um, so I'm just going to very briefly talk also, but my second C was on confusion, that there seems to be quite a lot of it, that notwithstanding indeed, much greater investment in learning and examining a little bit, if not a lot, that there's still quite significant confusion. And again, this is what the internal UN report um, highlights in relation to Sri Lanka, that um, there is a definition there, it is quite broad, 
but qu and quite often it gets lost in translation, but also I think it might be convenient that it's uh, the core of what it is we mean by protection does get lost in translation. Um, I think some of the other issue I will say about confusion, it seems to me, is that sometimes we confuse or are confused about what I call the essence of humanitarianism, which is surely about saving lives, and that we are much more comfortable with material assistance than we are, for want of a better way of putting this, with non-material assistance. In other words, uh, issues that put lives in danger, as well as obviously the dignity of the people who need help. Uh, I can come back to that, but in the interest of time, I won't elaborate on it further. Except to perhaps flag, because it also relates to the standards, is I think there's also significant confusion, and again, I don't want to keep referring maybe to Sri Lanka, but uh, between the differences, at least in my mind, and having worked in both, um, between humanitarian and human rights folk that um, quite often it is seen one of the same, and I would argue that they are quite distinct if quite often common objectives, but that the approach and uh, what needs to be done in terms of changing facts on the ground in a crisis setting will be different what humanitarians and what human rights folk do. Then my third C is competence, and I do want to underline that it exists, that unfortunately when one tries to, and I know Francesca is going to talk about this, when you try to look for the materials, not often readily available, but I do know a lot of good insights, a lot of good material exists, and a lot of, importantly, lots of important work is done to enhance protection of the ground, and we can discuss that in a short while. However, um, I think one of the problems in terms of competence is that what is protection is, is considered something parallel, something additional, and I think now we're sometimes in danger of those with the protection hat are, are put in their own separate room, and the rest of us who are doing humanitarian program uh, do what we do. When what I would argue for is what we need strategic and protective humanitarian program, that the way we go about it will have huge implications for the protection situation of people whose lives are at imminent risk. Okay, do I have time to flag just a few issues yes. going mm -hmm. forward, Wendy? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm not going to do all of them, but it was building on looking at crisis sets, different crisis situations in recent times and my own experience in Afghanistan where I did head up a human rights team, but the work we did on civilian casualties, we did it within a humanitarian context for lots of reasons which we don't have time to go into, but basically to insulate that initiative from the politics of the situation on the ground. So what I argue for these days is that what humanitarians have to do and are able to do is to identify patterns of harm, and that comes into our initial strategic analysis as well as needs assessment processes that often I think misses out on that. That we need to really desist from seeing assistance and protection as two separate things. They do interact and they do impact on each other, and we know that, so it's time I think we need to acknowledge it. That really, um, and it's every crisis situation, um, that we humanitarians have to be much more upfront about the way in which humanitarian endeavor is instrumentalized. This is a complicated word, but basically the way humanitarian programming is used for purposes at odds with humanitarian values and humanitarian objectives. I think this is something we can do better, we know about it, and we are capable of doing better. Um, the right to asylum, uh, I'm not going to dwell on it, but I think quite often it is separate to our general um, protection toolbox, and I would argue, again, based on my experience in Afghanistan, it's important that uh, we see population dis displacement in its entirety, and of course, um, this week or this past 10 days, we've seen what I'm now referring to as the Snowden affair, where the right to seek asylum seems to be, um, I don't know how to describe it, it's, it should, in international law, it cannot be seen as a hostile act, but we've seen kind of the empire strikes back when one individual who exposed um, abuses of the state when, this in, when uh, Edward Snowden sought asylum. Um, we know what that situation is still in limbo. And then very quickly, if I may, that um, talking about big picture issues that the world is changing and getting, getting on board with what I'm going to term the new world order, how we move forward in that. And underlining that in contrast to when I started out as an accidentally as a humanitarian practitioner back in the 1980s, now I would argue that there's much greater consensus on the importance of protection and protecting civilians. 
and of course we're operating in a different world thanks to technology, et cetera, et cetera. So I think one of the tasks moving forward is to build consensus on protection with new and emerging stakeholders and that we bite into the changing narrative on sovereignty. Maybe we can deal with this a little bit more in the question and answer period. And that we be aware of the changing times, um, that it is we have to move out of our Western embedded focuses to the universality of humanitarianism. And then the final thing I'm going to say, to keep inside my time limit, is that we should not be daunted. I was asked to talk a little bit about Afghanistan and I haven't really been able to do that in the time period available. But I do want to underline that contrary to um, a lot of perspectives, that, but it's now acknowledged a few years later, but that the work initiated in 2008 to bring attention to the impact of war on civilians, and that included a number of activities from systematically documenting it to a lot of advocacy and dialogue behind the scenes, as well as some um, public reporting and public conversations, that there is evidence to show that that effort was, was worthwhile. And I'm flagging Afghanistan, not just because I was there and know it quite intimately, but because it was widely, and perhaps rightly or whatever, seen as one of the more complicated places on which to move forward on protection, given that our usual allies were themselves belligerents in that crisis situation. So going forward, I would say don't be daunted. Uh, we have these updated standards to help us, and that um, there is going to be new curveballs throwing in our direction. But building on past experience, we can do better than we have done in the past. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you very much, Nora. I'm not going to try to waste time by summarizing what Nora's just said so clearly. I mean, she's talked about commitment, confusion, and competence. And she's identified some issues that we need to be aware of as we go forward. And most importantly, she's advising us not to be daunted by the, the challenges that we face, and that we should use things like these standards to help us. I, I do, I have a question for you, Nora, though. I know you weren't able to talk about Afghanistan in, in much detail. But, um, I mean, if you're comparing, if you can compare what, you know, approaches or the challenges and approaches that were taken in Afghanistan with Sri Lanka, I mean, what are the differences really um, about the different approaches taken by the humanitarian human rights communities? Were there really different choices they could make given the, the context involved? Could you talk a little bit about that? Um. I mean, clearly every situation has, to, and every, every, the analysis and the response has to be very, very crisis specific. I, uh, that's, you know, in thinking about this over this past short while before coming here to London, um, I do consider, and given, and I have spent some time trying to understand what happened and didn't happen in Sri Lanka, but I do consider the commitment is absolutely fundamental. That uh, these crises, of course, are god awful and really complicated and very difficult. But if there is a, a commitment at the individual agency and an, at the collective system, it is possible to bite into these problems. I think that, unfortunately, and I don't want to be too harsh on colleagues who an awful lot did traumatize and understandably so about what happened and the terrible loss of life. We've been using a figure of 40,000, but now it's gone up to, I see in recent times, 70,000 in, in the final weeks and months of that um, long war, 25 years of war, that um, I think that unfortunately there was a certain complacency, a, a certain concern that, oh, this is too difficult to bite into, that uh, the focus was on once the war is over, to a large extent, which I think missed out on the real inhumanity that of course is comparable in, in every situation it produces its own level of brutality and inhumanity but I do sometimes wonder did the uh, lack of energy on the inhumanity uh, with the exception of a few actors um, and ICRC was able to do much better than most does does that have implications for Syria so you s I, yeah I can't make you know automatic comparisons between the two settings, but I think really having the commitment and the energy to challenge in humanity is fundamental to being effective humanitarian operators. 